Hi everybody. Um, hope everybody is uh, is well. Um, very excited this evening to be hosting another Instagram uh, hour live. Uh, this time we have the one and only um, Francesco Bernardini from uh, Genova in Italy. I'm really excited to um, to be speaking to Francesco because he's a, an incredibly uh, intelligent guy. He's also a colleague of mine um with tioxane and uh i'm really really to have him have him with us and this is your opportunity this evening um to, to use this guy this guy here <laughs> um, to your advantage because it's you you won't get any uh you don't get many opportunities to speak to someone of the caliber of Francesco Bernardini, and uh, I think he should use this as an educational uh, opportunity to ask him uh, questions uh, related to the periorbital area. So, good evening, uh, Francesco. How are you? Good, Lee. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you discussing whatever you want to discuss. Uh, so, I'm really looking forward to this opportunity. I'm going to be guided by your fans here because you've got a lot of fans here uh, <laughs> on, on there, and uh, I've, I've seen some. I've seen some big names pop up, so it's uh, really? there's no pressure on. There's no pressure on you here. Can you give you? Uh, well, a man who doesn't need many introductions. Can you just introduce yourself to those who are uh, uh, who don't uh, know you? Yeah, well, uh, I need to introduce me by starting with my job position, meaning uh, I'm an oculoplastic surgeon, and many people don't really know what that is, uh, especially in non-English-speaking uh, um, countries, because uh, it's very difficult to get a formal training. Uh, first of all, uh, I come from uh, the field of uh, ophthalmology. Uh, I became an ophthalmologist here in Italy, uh, and then I, but just before term, uh, finishing my, my training in that, I uh, studied um, the habilitation exam to get to be a, uh, licensed as a doctor in the United States. It's called the United States Medical License Examination. And I got a position at the University of Cincinnati for a formal clinical fellowship in the field of oculoplastic surgery. Oculoplastic surgery is... We, you know, we forget the eye, basically. Don't do any cataract, any retina, and we focus on whatever is around the eye. And you might think just the lids, but it's not. It's just the lids, uh, anteriorly, uh, the nasolacrimal duct system uh, on the medial side, and posteriorly is, is the orbit. So the, the, the whatever make helps the, uh, the, the eye to work, to, you know, to function, the muscles, the nerves, the lacrimal gland and everything. So we do a bunch of uh, functional stuff. We start with that as a hospital position, doing all the surgery around that. And then eventually, as a side, we do uh, blepharoplasty, and then we start with the aesthetic part also. Excellent. Um how did your journey into aesthetics begin, um, Francesco? Was it an easy transition in, or did somebody introduce you? How, how, how did you find your way into aesthetics? It has been a long journey, I must uh, admit, uh, as uh, I came out. Uh, we're talking now um, uh, the year 2000, when I returned after the two years fellowship, and I was really eager to get into surgery, big stuff, tumors, trauma, uh, eyelid reconstruction, big difficult cases, the more the better. Uh, so I really wanted to get my hands on uh, many, as many surgery under the belt as possible. And, uh, uh, and that was hospital university based. Uh, and then on the other side, to help the private pro, uh, position, I mean the private work, I did uh, blepharoplasty. That was my aesthetic part, surgery. And I was so silly back then. Then when uh, an occasional patient would ask me if I also did any injection, Botox or filler back then, I say, no, I don't do that. I'm a surgeon. Why would I, you know, like mingle with that? So <laughs> I was that stupid. <laughs> yeah. So. So 
So congratulations on your two recent publications as well. For those who haven't read them, they're both uh, coming up pretty soon. And I know one has already been sort of published now um, on the dysmorphic uh, lower lid. And then you've, you've got the other one now on, on the late onset edema. And they're both incredibly fascinating uh, articles because you know as well as me, it's, it's the most common area for HA complications, the tear trough. Is there a reason, do you think there's an anatomical reason why, why, why it's such a challenge? Um, it is interesting because um, we started looking at the lower lid because it's the most common complication. Uh, you know, when you go to meetings, the first, the most important thing is to be concerned about not causing blindness or so vascular event or that such. And, and everybody's speaking about that. But Actually, what the, the but bread and butter of our practice is, at least as a subspecialist, is to see all this edema between the eyelid and, 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 the, and the cheek. And at the time of the HA filler existence, there is no other medical condition that causes that. So first of all, recognition is, uh, should be a really sight recognition. You say it once, you say it all the time. You don't need to work those patients up for me uh, to do heart, uh, kidney failures, anything like that. It's just, did you have a previous injection in the face? And that opens up uh, um, a significant thing. Uh, the reason why is just, it's impossible to determine. Uh, we try to um, in our to propose a mechanism because what is interesting in that uh, in our experience uh, is that the patient has a previous injection and is very happy with that one year, two year, and then they start noticing something going is going wrong for them. It's getting worse, so they pre an average presentation of that complication of lower eyelid edema, malar edema. Uh, caused by HA, in, on average, occurs after three years of the original injection. That's why we, we call it what to do after a good injection turned bad. And, and the patient don't uh, uh, combine the two, don't link the two event. I mean, the injection with the complication, because it takes so many, so long time to, uh, to present itself. And it, it doesn't, and need, not even the injector realized that. So, but for us, it was uh, very difficult to, uh, to come, you know, like reviewers were asking, what was the material? Uh, where was it injected? How do I ask a patient to be specific? Three years mm -hmm. later, I mean, they don't even, most of the patient didn't, no, I never had injection here. They inject me here, so. But then you do a yellow and days, it goes away, and you know that it, what it is. Yeah, because uh, the very frustrating thing for you within this, uh, this publication is that all of these patients, you inherited them retrospectively. You, they, they come to you with, and, and another colleague with, exactly. with the problems. And, and one of the most remarkable things I read from the data is that, like you said, uh, uh, a third of those patients, uh, I think there were 60, 61 patients, a third of those presented three years. Yes. Three uh, years. Uh, three years is the average presentation yeah. time. So we had patients eight years and 10 years even. And what you know that is interesting, you ask me if there is a, an anatomical uh, reason for that. Uh, I think there is an, an, a complicated anatomy here because all the complications that occur around the eye Manifest, present themselves right in the medial third. Uh, if, you, if you know, in the past, I injected the tear trap with the uh, radius. I was the only one, probably the first one, and I also published on that. Uh, and you get all the complication here again. Mm -hmm. um, so, what is wrong in this area? I don't know, but it is really something about quantities. Type of material, I mean, the, the, the Teoxan technique, I mean, the ATP anatomy, you need to inject at the right plane. Uh, you need to inject the right material. You need to inject with the right technique, all of that. Plus yeah. something else that uh, resides in the nature 
it's of the HA itself. It's mechanism of degradation. I have no scientific certainty here to give you, but we postulated that, you know, that to fill up a space of a determined space with the hyaluronic acid, you need that amount of gel, right? Then mm -hmm. with time, let's say after a year, the HA goes, uh, undergoes degradation, isovolumetric degradation. So it will maintain the same volume, but there will be less hyaluronic acid and more water. And the more the time goes by, the more water will accumulate there. And then that's when you will see the, the complication. Uh, it takes typically two years and it gets worse at three years and the patient shows up and say, it's not getting any better. It's supposed to go away because uh, eventually it's hyaluronic acid. It's written, it goes away after eight months. So why still there? We don't know. We don't know why not everybody has that problem. Some po people do, some other don't. It, it's, really it's really interesting concept because I've had a couple of ideas o over the years as why I see the late presentation. Like you said, with the isovolumetric -vol sort of almost lift that you get, uh, edema with it as it breaks down. There was a couple of thoughts. What is the increased surface area for the water to attract to the HA? And the other thing for me is that when HA filler is broken down, uh, it gets broken down into low molecular weight and it's... It, exactly. It would, attracts it more water. Yeah. So you have it more... It stimulates... Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, but how do you uh, demonstrate that scientifically? is uh, virtually impossible. So it's it just... Um... The, the other thing, um, Francesco, is the fact that um, there is low levels of hyaluronidase in the teotroph area. Um, so again, it, it's going to take quite a long time. Plus, it's not subject to those forces which the other areas of the face, so the, di you know, I, the I, mechanics. It's interesting, exactly. The mechanics of the orbicularis. We also had... Uh, some histological evidence of the orbicularis muscle it, within, uh, because I, I found myself in doing some blepharoplasty. Nowadays for us to do a virgin blepharoplasty is rare. Mm -hmm. So there is always something, uh, injected fat, injected radius, a mixture of stuff. Uh, so, you know, you, I got a little biopsy of muscle with, uh, within the HA and got it uh, histologically examined. But the, I definitely see there is a change of a function as a biomodulation, said by Di Maio. I think uh, there is a change in function, reduced pump function. You will have less wrinkles in the injected phase, but maybe of the stretch, maybe of the reduced forces, improved uh, contraction of the muscle. I don't know, but there is less uh, muscle force. The muscle is, the fibers are not infiltrated, meaning the muscle is okay, but there is a lot of amorphous materials between the muscle fibers. And what is interesting that is so much more common in the lower lids, but is not unusual to see the same edema years later in the upper lid. That's what is the second uh, paper about. It's like uh, an, a new finding because uh, up to now there were only scattered, isolated, single case reports here and there, no more than 10. We have like, again, with this friend of mine, oculoplastic guy from uh, Jerusalem, um, uh, Maurice Arstein, very smart, brilliant guy. We observed the same thing. We treated all this patient. And the upper, it's whatever is, is even more interesting. And I would like to hear what are your thoughts about that we observed three types of presentation uh, in the upper eyelid edema complication. We had, uh, the most common part is central brow eyelid edema, right? Coming probably from the injection direct to in the roof, right? Then we have lateral edema, like right here. Then we have a medial, what we have called a medial bubble. And then the final was at least uh, uh, the, uh, a small part, but the most interesting part is the pretarsal orbicularis edema with eyelid ptosis, meaning the eyelid droops down. 
And for the medial bubble and the preterse orbicularis, I believe the injections was placed here in the glabella because if I look at the patient uh, sideways, they look like an uh, avatars. They were mm -hmm. straight noses. And you could even see the, the, the flow of the hyaluronic acid down here through the supratrochlear groove uh, and uh, going into the orbicular. So that is uh, something that, um, you know, it's interesting, I thought. Now, are these, were those cases for A-frame deformity or was it just lateral brow elevation or a combination of both? Exactly. How do, uh, the, the other difficulty here is the, the, this patient, again, is the timing that it makes it impossible to determine what, where, how, the patient have multiple visit to uh, uh, injector, not even the same injector, many different injectors. So what is my technique? Where do I inject? What I inject for? I inject, I think the temple injection may spill mm -hmm. over laterally, the roof centrally, the glabella medially and down to the, I mean, th that's how I, uh, I classified in my, in my head. So, and, you know, I always ask if the patient had, but they don't, they say, I, th I thought it was Botox. I didn't mm -hmm. even know it was a filler. So how do you? Could, could, could any of those cases, both upper and lower, be due to rep, a retroceptal injection? Because I've seen a couple of those uh, again, and you have, you have a multitude of problems, uh, Francesco, with those. So for the, for the viewers watching, how can, how can, the, how can the injector avoid a retroceptal injection? Very well said. It's, uh, you should always avoid that because there is no point in going retroceptal. And why is that? Because the orbital septum divided whatever is anterior, that is the eyelid, to whatever is posterior, which is the orbit. So you really don't want to go into the orbit because in the orbit, there are the extraocular muscles uh, in the lower leg, the oblique muscle, the fat, uh, the bags, the nerve. Once you are mm. in, you cannot, you don't have any other barrier to it. It can spread everywhere, right? So you don't want to really inject. And even injecting in the orbit, if you get a vessel and you make it bleed, it becomes an orbital hemorrhage or you and a small infection, biofilm infection in the orbit. So you're opening a new uh, chapter that you don't, you want to leave the book closed right there. So the septum should not be injected. But what I think, if you get into the septum and you inject it, that is a technical mistake. Mm -hmm. And technical mistakes or wrong materials show themselves quite at an early stage. That's what I would definitely, divided into early complication resulting from poor injection, poor anatomical placement, poor material, choice of material, to late complication. The treatment was okay. So what I tell patients is that that can happen. What was wrong? Nothing. You need to change the, your old hyaluronic acid. You know, lady, this Filler should be there for a year. After that, you have a problem. We need to clear that, clear that up. Put a new one. So what, what is all? I, I also would like to add to the retroceptal injection. It's not, just, uh, it's not just exclusive to fillers. If you give toxin behind the, the orbital septum, then you're in strabismus, then you've got diplopia, then you've got all of those uh, palsies that can occur as well. So I understand in the, uh, the, the tissue layers of the eye is incredibly important. And um, tissue depth, I think, I think it's the number one area for technical problems uh, that, that I see because it's, it's such an unforgiving area. Now, within your, uh, within your papers, you, you give three treatment options. One is what I think is one of the best options is just to watch and wait and just to see if the problem, uh, what we call that watchful waiting or uh, just hand holding. And then you, you had two options, which was how you one of these, which again is, is a go to. And the other was br uh, blepharoplasty. So removal of the, of the offending uh, HA with that. What, 
I would like to ask as a personal question to you is, is there room for oral corticosteroids within that, within the management modalities in your opinion now? No, no, because um, we need to remind ourselves what steroids are for. They are anti-inflammatory, right? And there is no inflammation there. That is not a hot uh, area. It's not rubber, or tumor, you know, that's no sign of inflammation. So if there's no inflammatory, you're not treating anything with steroids. And in fact, you can try. How would you though, give the patient systemic, patient, uh, systemic steroid? Uh, you would not get any response, probably. I, you know, like, patient would be unsatisfied, would have complication from systemic steroids and not get in anywhere. Um, it's not, I don't think that is the problem. What the, the problem that I learned the hard way, as uh, always happened in my life, is that the patient hand-holding don't do any good to these people. Because if you know that on average, this complication occurs at three years, how many more years are you willing to get your patient to wait for that to go away on its own? So you don't want to yeah. treat that patient. So you tell her, I'll see you next year, right? But that patient, if that happens in Italy near me, they come and see me. They don't come and see you anymore because they want to mm -hmm. get that fixed. Because they, you know, that's uh, weight, waxing and waning, swelling every morning. They wake up, they say, yeah. this it cannot go on any, any further. They, but the problem is when you inject them with hyaluronidase, is what they see is not so nice. Cause, um... <clears throat> because I, I think, um, Francesco, that a lot of patients get used to the swelling and and yes. and when it and what and when it goes they lose their reference points completely so they go look doc it, this is so <laughs> much worse <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> this is worse you've made me worse exactly yeah. and and where the problem is exactly that i tell you what is the problem because they don't know who gave them that problem because it comes for three years before and you tell them it was <laughs> she was <would> all <laughs> again. I'm sorry, um, but uh, what uh, the funny thing is uh, when you treat them with, with the other days, you know that the next day they will be, it will all be gone. They will look at themselves in the mirror. They will say, "That was a doctor." That they exactly can pinpoint you as the one that make them look so. If you give them an, uh, an explanation before, that is an explanation. But if you tell them after, that is an excuse. So you need to prepare your patient. Tell him, you know, you have this problem. Are you willing to, you know, watch and see or you want to treat it? Okay, here we are. Yeah, go on. So are, are, are we telling patients now, or are you telling patients now that in three years you could get a speed bump? The speed bump, I, I would not put everything into the same pot because I believe what, um, what you and others, Sabrina is the speed bump uh, uh, person that, but it, it, it might be because of the uh, wrong uh, fat compartment injected with the wrong filler. And then we get it back again. We don't speak names. You were not here for that. But you need to use the right filler for the right fat compartment. So you cannot put anything that doesn't move into something in a place where it moves, right? That will show up. And that could be a reason. But I don't tell my patient, you can get one. But if you have, I tell them, problems can occur at any time. I injected, if I, I'm the person that injected you, come and see me before you see anybody else if you have a problem with any place, okay? Because I know what to do. And if I, I tell them I'll inject you with the other days, come back in 15 days and we'll see how it looks. So that's the point of that paper. After the days, 
The problem is only 10% of the patients were happy. So they ended up fine. So they say, thank you, you, you fixed my problem, I, I'm good to go. 10% accepted to undergo blepharoplasty because they had show of the tear trough, of the bags. The problem, they originated the treatment, but then for, they forgot how they look like under that three years of progressive swelling. While the swelling goes, takes three years and slowly creeps up, while you inject them, then bring them back. Mm -hmm all of a sudden. So 80% of the patient requested that secondary treatment of filler. So what I think it was the novelty of, the, of that paper is that, you know, the tendency of ma many practitioner to not tell the patient that had HA related edema that they could be re-injected with HA. Say, ah, no, I cannot tolerate that. I'm allergic to HA. Yeah. If you fix that and you use, I tell them, there, is, there are better techniques and there are better materials. We can go ahead and, have, and probably you will not have it again. If you will have it, I'll fix it. So if we escape from the complications, then, then we get scared. That's what keeps the people from injecting the tear trough because if you tell them not to use the yellow days because it can make them look worse, then you are less prone, inclined to treat that area, I believe. So that's... I think a lot of injectors, Francesco, I think they get greedy with the tear trough. They try to put too much in, or they'll try to use something a little bit thicker to eradicate the tear trough, when in some patients, a tear trough is just normal anatomy. They've always had a tear trough. You see kids with tear troughs, or they try to eradicate the uh, vascularity or the color of the muscle, or something like that, and then this is where the problem is. So, how do you assess the how do you assess the tear trough or the lower lid? How, how what, what's the oculoplastic way to do it? Look, I am pretty hot on this topic, so please. Uh, <laughs> listen, um, let me ask you something. How much would you say you inject on average on a patient that requests a tear trough? A, te a tear trough. If you would have asked me about six or seven years ago, I'd probably say around about 0 0.6 per eye. Now it's around about 0 0.2. Okay, fine. Um, let, me, let me tell you this. <clears throat> First of all, if we keep on looking at the tear trough, we are limiting our view to a third of the infraorbital region defect. So we are missing what I look at most with interest is the two thirds of central lateral two third of the, and if you look at that, many patients come to us nice and normal here, and then you see a step empty, you look at the skeletonization there. So uh, I do surgery in the lower lid, and, and I do injections in the lower lid as well. And I came to a point where the two blends in very well. And that blending point is right about here. If you take here and you lift up here surgically, look at my, look here. If I yeah. lift up here, you get everything gone here. My bags are gone. My trough is gone. The skin is better. So this point, if you get the lift here, you improve the lids by treating laterally indirectly improving here and you need to inject less so do you treat the palpable malar groove first before the tear trough or exactly, do you treat the exactly. okay that's a point behind the concept that um i'm very keen on using i know i know i know this yeah, your lateral your, your lateral line of ligaments i know i know because you were involved in this publication um, you know, I know you know. I know you know. I know you know because we did. We you know we had the chat on the trainer. The the trainers said it's a really it's a really interesting concept with the lateral line of ligaments here. For those who don't know, they're associated with the muscles of mastication, and they hold the lateral face back. And I think it's a really good because just doing this on myself, I can see the improvements in the tear trough. And this is the reason why you are on this 
Instagram Live to educate not just the other people who are watching, to me as well. <laughs> right. No, so no, this no, is... But it's a good point, because if I tell you, if you read the paper, um, that paper was, uh, was uh, very, very well written, I believe. It, it's a difficult concept. Uh, it was brilliant for me to work with uh, Gabriella Casabona, which is, uh, the, she is the idea behind it. And I'm uh, the eye guy. So I inject so many, I mean, basically I inject all, only the eye. So, and Sebastian Cotofana and this, uh, the two factors that are very good are the lateral line of ligament. You inject the lateral, you need to inject less medial. Lifting versus volumizing. Okay, so that is the first concept. The second concept is finding this sweet spot, aesthetic sweet stuff for the lower lid. So if the G point called G point, man, we are not uh, any going. It's anywhere. not a gynecology one. No, 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 no. no. But, but uh, is uh, um, is called like that even in in the text of the manuscript. So it is scientifically accepted. Uh, this sweet spot G point. Uh, technique. If you attach this deep, start with this, inject right here, and it's always that point, with a high, uh, high cohesivity feeler, very strong, and I, I will not give you names unless you specifically ask, but think of the highest cohesivity that you have. Deep on the bone, periosteum, here you get this first, I mean, not that much, uh, but you have a stretch. Then uh, again, you support at the, v de at the apex of the V deformity. So this one will give you lift, this central support, and you have not touched a tear trap yet. So then you treat the tear trap. So this is an indirect treatment of the tear trap. And then we start coming with a cannula here and come across and you know the are you familiar i know you are familiar with the swift technique um of uh, bridging yes for the nasolabial is is it goes with the bridging yeah apply the bridging technique to the tear trough microboluses so this is a macrobolus this is a macrobolus of a high cohesivity uh, filler these are microboluses or retrolinear, uh, retrograde linear delivery of microboluses 0 0.001. So by the end of the injection of the of the two the treatment in our paper, on that paper we have noticed that the average quantity of direct HA placement in the tear trough is zero point. Zero five, so a wow. tenth, a tenth of what usually, on average, normal injectors inject in the tear trap. And I ask you, which one do you think is the safest technique, where you inject in a hole with the needle 0.5 cc or less 0.0. I mean, which one will be likely, more likely to have problems? So, uh, yeah. the, other, the other thing is this G point, it's because you're so smart. I want to use this as an opportunity to give you food for thought, stuff to work on together as a group of people, you know, like it, is the, the Mahler point, the G point is lateral to the orbital, directly to the orbital, uh, orbital, uh, orbital, uh, malar, uh, orbital retaining ligament, right? It's right here. So that's the most effect on that, but indirectly also to the zygomatic of cutaneous ligament. So it has a stretching effect also on the mid phase. So if this, if we, I use this point as a starting point for the mid phase, and for the eye, because it gives you this first. So, and then you treat the nasal labial fold indirectly. In our paper with Cotofana, we have noticed that a, a lengthening of the distance from the G point to the, to the angle of the nose and, and, and uh, area of the nose, of, you know, like all these points, 
the, indicating that the G point was elevated. The lower limb shortened. So, Francesco, are you using the uh, orbicularis and zygomaticus retaining ligament? You're using the space in between to stretch the two ligaments like this? Be behind. Behind. So it's doing this? Yeah. Yes, you are right there. You are right there, and your your high uh, viscosity uh, material point. One, and when I speak about macrobolosis, I usually refer to point one. So say, okay, point one prepare yourself very strong here. It will give you an effect, primary effect on the orbital orbital retaining ligament and. Secondary effect, stretch also on this. Now, if from here you go farther back, you will affect the lower part of the, uh, the central part of the nasolabial, farther back, the lower part. So you will get this kind of treatment. So it's less, it's more peripheral and less central. Because injection in complication of the tear trap can come from injecting the cheek and not yes. just the tear trap. So, the less you inject centrally in this pre no pre zygomatic pre um, help me with the pre zygomatic and pre um, space um, the pre maxillary the, space pre maxillary space sorry i was uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but i, I agree uh, this is such a common area for for edema it's here so the patients who are not receptive to uh, hyaluronic acid filler or they've got festoons or they're, they're, they're surgical, when does the average mere mortal like myself need to refer to someone like you for surgery? What, what are the, what's the tipping point where they've gone from non-surgical to surgical? That's an excellent question. Because uh, you can, I, I treat not only the trough, uh, but also the bags, now they, in my practice, I'm a surgeon and I'm an injector. So, and I am a competency to it, to my two practices, right? But the patients come for me um, and most of the lower lid patients ask me for injection before doing surgery. When is the time I tell them, no, I cannot inject you. Big medial bags, I cannot cover those. You know, minor bags re respond very well. But when they are too big, medial, I cannot mask them very well. Or malar festoon or mounds. If the mounds and festoon are slightly different animals, for a mount, I will refer to, I use a very much a four NAS classification. I'm working on that, and on that right now. But... Um, it has been published recently on the aesthetic surgery journal and everything. But the Mahler mount is a triangular shape right below the orbital rim, lateral to the lateral canthus, is a swelling. It doesn't have to be with the skin, it's a swelling. That is uh, uh, an animal that nobody knows what's going on. Uh, it's, uh, I get it to you with your theories of uh, uh, correct uh, of um, that space. Uh, the ligaments, the lymphatics, all of that. Festoons are overhanging skin that by pass over the orbital ring, but it's skin only. Skin only can be supported if it is not a malar mount, so no lymphatics, no fluid accumulation. If it's a fluid, any sign of fluid accumulation, I will not inject because you're asking for trouble, right? Big mm -hmm. bags. I don't inject. Malar mount, I don't inject. For soon, I, you can get some stretch, you can get some help. But when they get too big and the surgery really get, gets you those out of the way, why would you try to achieve a less optimal surgery uh, result with the treatment, having the patient the, running the risk to lose the patient? And when, you know, like... So for your patients, Francesco, who uh, are undergoing surgery, what is the social downtime? So how long is the downtime post-surgery? And what are the, what are the risks involved in? Let, let's just take, for example, a lower, a lower blepharoplasty. So how long am I going to be staying at home for? It's at amazing. Eight to, okay. It's and what, what are the risks? 
It's a very good question. Well, um, realistic, talking about uh, between colleagues, because if I was to, to speak about risk to a patient, I would need to start by, you know, patients are, die from a blepharoplasty because they get into an ORR. So we need really to take it a serious procedure. But having said that, those are theoretical complications. The complication from lower leads for lower blepharoplasty are really, are you going to remove skin or you're not going to remove skin? If you're not removing skin, I always go 100% of the time, transconjunctivally, so no scar. Second, surgery will give you what? Transposition, for me, is always like that. Remove the lateral fat pad. That will go. The central and medial fat pad can be freed. We lift up internally. We lift up the attachment of the orbicularis from the orbital rim until we see the attachment of the zygomatic or the, of the uh, elevator nasal um, um, superior na uh, na Levator labii superior aquiline nasi. Yeah. <laughs> I got. I got. Uh, <laughs> and, it's a long. And, it's a long and, word. It's, uh, and then once you lift that up, you transpose the fat there. What you fix? You fix the bulge of the bag and the empty of the valley. By emptying the bag, filling the valley, you achieve a smooth contour. And you fix the, the fat outside with a single stitch that just uh, uh, breaks the skin. If you do that with... Uh, Normally, with the uh, electrocautery or laser, at seven day post-operative time, the patient will, rem five days I remove the stitch, the patient can wear some makeup, they go out, it's barely visible. So, what is the, I mean, seriously, sometimes when we inject the eye, and some people do inject with, with needle, I mean, you can get a bruise, that can last longer than my surgical bruise. So if we compare that, I mean, we get too close. But the problem is injections can be done with a cannula. You can go out with your friends the very same night. You leave my office the very same day looking good already. So why would I undergo to a so much more expensive procedure when I can get it now, right? Looking me immediately improved. So that is, uh, it's not, I don't think the downtime of surgery or uh, the long postoperative uh, recovery time is the immediateness of what the patient nowadays wants. So we've got lots of questions coming through. We've got around about 20 minutes left. So I'm going to go through some of the questions if you don't mind, Francesco, because you've got a big fan sure. base here, obviously. <laughs> sure. Are you using any energy-based devices in the uh, periorbital? I'm, I'm not. Every, each of us has uh, their own weak parts, and that is my own. I would like to, but I got to the point where I, uh, I master the Plexer. Plexer is a brand name, I know, but we is, is a radio frequency device uh, that kind of count, burns, um, burns the superficial layer of the skin. I use that a lot for santelasma, small skin tags. Um, sometimes I don't use it for soft blepharoplasty. I don't believe in that because the patient really wants a good result right there, there and that surgery is unbeatable when you have overhanging skin. But I do love the flexor of that kind of device uh, to tighten the skin of the lower limb because it really is effective. So I use it more in the lower lid than in the uppers. I don't, I'm not a very big uh, energy-based uh, guy. And I tell you why. Because I have, my main office is in Genova, but I do have very busy office in Milan. And I do have office in Rome, Naples. So how would I carry my own device? Or how would I have the same device in each part. I mean, it's um, uh, um, practical. I'm not a skin guy. I, I only do the techniques or the procedures whose complication I can manage. If I cannot mm -hmm. manage skin infection, uh, pigment, I cannot, I would need to undergo uh, dermatologic 
training. So why is that is the case? A patient really is benefits that. Why don't you refer? I mean, I cannot. I'm not that kind of doctor. I'm not. Uh, I'm I, I'm not good at that. So I I refer them out to a good dermatologist friend of mine that would refer the surgery eventually. So it's a good, you know, like. Uh, yeah, it's the same as me. I don't use any energy-based devices because, like you say, uh, it's the number one reason for litigation in the UK. Uh, and it, it's a very it, – I, I think you have to be a specialist in lasers to be to be doing this all the time. Hey. I know the answer to the next question, but I'll let you answer it. Some of these has to have which had hyaluronidase you use under the eye. <laughs> which type? Uh, we'll go. We'll go with the under eye because I know the under eye no, you no, use no. more than the upper. No, no, no. no. Oh, which guy? Which uh, which uh, brand uh, you mean? No, no, no. How much? How much? How much? Sorry. Uh, it's uh, again. Do you want the short answer or the long answer? Because uh, I started. I was uh, instructed at the beginning to inject. I want. I don't want to say it wrong, but uh, hundreds units per point, or it was a thousand, or I don't know, 120. So uh, like a huge number compared to what I inject now. Now I'm at 3.5 units of hyaluronidase I get inside the, in the, like say, I take, I bunch it up, I stay in the middle, I inject. Usually it is three points or four or then it's 3.5, but it was used to 100 per point, so I can double it up at seven if there is a big swelling. And I tell the patient, I want to be like less, because, you know, yellow days has two sort of problems. It's very effective. And uh, I have the sense it also attacks your own hyaluronic acid. But our own will be reconstituted quickly in 48 hours. So I'm not afraid of that really, but the, you know, if you don't need to inject all that amount, why would you waste so much uh, uh, my own hyaluronic acid? So I wanna affect the least possible my own. I wanna just act on that. Eventually tell the patient, come back and I'll, uh, I'll uh, inject you more, but I wanna go slow because if I get to the right exact spot where I want to go, the patient be, then is the, the, the ideal. If I go too deep, I mean too empty, I will need to treat the patient with a new filler. So at least I, I came down from hundreds. Now I'm down on 3.5 per point, seven at most, probably. It's yeah, and those are really, really small amounts because um, uh, I, I, I go a little bit more uh, industrial than you. And I'm trying, I, because I don't like to retreat the patient again because it puts them under the risk of infection, edema, a hematoma, and they've got a, maybe there's a bit more social downtime. So I, my dose is a little bit so higher. How, but how, I, much, how much do you inject? Like well, on, it de- on the hundred? It, it, de- it depends because if I, if I feel that the uh, complication is coming from uh, the cheek, then I know it's not going to be a very light filler, which you can easily wash away with your hand your other days. I know this is going to be highly cross-linked. I know it's going to be highly cohesive, and I know there's going to be a lot in there. So I need to use I need to use wait, my uh... wait. Use follow my my reasoning. Uh, I know what study you're referring to when you say uh, not all the hyaluronic the uh, hyaluronic acid respond at the same amount of, I mean, there are a thicker one, the one that require more, but we're talking about a, about another animal. We are talking about hyaluronic acid that is going away, cooling, attracting water. So it's not, the more, what is interesting is the more edema is there, it's not that there is more hyaluronic acid, it's less if you try to lower your doses, you will see that you will get the same amount of. Uh, so you won't, don't, I don't even know what hyaluronic is in there. I mean, which, which kind, which type. So I inject whatever it is, let's say more seven than 3.5, but say seven. 
Okay, and then go yeah, to fifteen. Try fifteen. My my, my doses my doses are so much higher, and this is this is the wonderful thing about science. We can we can disagree, and we can say well, one of the things well, one of the things with me is that I never have to do it twice. That's fine, but why? I mean, I already did inject at hundred to hundred, and they came down. I'm not getting back, so you might want to try or stay there. I mean, nothing. I, I will try. I will try because. I, I like I like the fact that like anything in medicine, like you don't give everybody three grams of amoxicillin. You try to have the minimum inhibitory dose. So I'm going to try that. I, I I'll start to reduce my dose down and and yeah. see. But your your concentration is the same as mine. You just use one cc. Is that correct, or do you use three cc one for the corrective? One yeah. CC. So it's it's concentrated in terms of what people are tending to use. Um, Carolina wants to know where your G point is. <laughs> I know you. I know that that is. Uh, no, that's a real question, <laughs> Francesco. I, I promise you. Okay. I know we're friends, but that, that's a genuine question. What's up? What's up, Lee? <laughs> so, uh, hinder lines from the area of the nose to the tragus, okay, uh, from the uh, corner of the mouth to the um, corner of the eye. Right? So these are the inner line. You, you draw a bisectrix that makes a 90 degree angle with a tangent that comes from the, uh, from the angle of the eye. So this will be the G point right here. And I draw it every time. And I draw it in surgery. And I draw it, if I want to do, I come down with an endoscopic lifting and I want to do a malar lift. I mark down the G point and I do this. And, and, and again, in surgery, I do this first because I know that I have to do less here. And with filler, it's the same thing. I treat this first and then less here. So it has to be behind the lateral orbital rim as well. It has to be behind the rim. Not behind the rim. It's, uh, okay. It's, it's probably about where the rim is. It's, um, okay. Yes. Not lateral to it? No. Just where I my mean, finger is? Uh, I mean, it's as a precise location. Is a I can pinpoint uh, if uh, if I knew how to do it, I can show you. So for your viewers only, I'll show you um, how to find the G point right there. So let me see if I can do it. Yes. Wow! Look at this. This is this is the quality of education you're getting, everybody. This is amazing. So you see that is. The G point. Unfortunately, I wish we were. I was a master of some something else, but uh, that is the G point uh, right there. So I think that answers your question. Then I mark down the the V deformity, right? And that is the projection the projection of the orbital rim that I depict. So above that, I cannot inject, but below, below, yes. And then uh, and that is you see lateral to the lateral line line of ligament. Perfect, perfectly, perfectly done. <laughs> Francesco, is there any consideration for the zygomatical facial foramen or artery at, at that position? Zygoma yeah. uh, that's a good question. Uh, zygomatical facial. Very, very good question because uh, <clears throat> when, I, when, I talk, when I hear uh, vascular complication uh, talks, I never hear speaking about that artery here because that is uh, uh, an area of anastomosis between in, uh, internal and external carotid circulation, and that can give you. And that sits right there where everybody is injecting with needle, cannulas, anything. So I say, in my opinion, if you treat anything with a 25G cannula, then really, you know, like, I'm not saying you are safe, but you are safer uh, than going, you know, like many people go, place the, the needle on the bone thinking that you are safe and then inject with the needle. That is not in this area specifically because of that artery. If I come down from here, I stay on the periosteum. Uh, I'm, uh, I know those vessels where they come from. They are a little lower compared to where I am, but I cannot tell you my injection point there is totally safe. I would never say that because that artery, I'm not the infraorbital. I mean, you really need to try 
to get it. And even that, you might not be able to because it's really difficult to get it. But that one is the, the riskier area. But the eyes, Lee, the eyes are not, you have to uh, revise the literature because there are two papers from the same group of people. The first paper that reviewed the literature indicating three points of infraorbital treatment as cause of uh, blindness. That was not true. I review, revised those papers were coming from the Chinese literature and the patient yeah. underwent palm facial treatment. So how can you say that? The second paper, they did not find a case of blindness coming from infraorbital treatment. So, but, yeah, I, I agree. There's no there's no cases of HA related blindness to the tear trough. Oh. I, I'm in 100 percent agreement with you. What we did find uh there is an associated case with blindness with PRP, PRF. Do you use PRP or PRF, or or you just you just uh, are, are you not? I I don't use it alone as a mm, uh, medical treatment injection of PRP because if I cannot see the difference between before and after, I cannot sell it. So for me, is is I'm a, I'm lim very limited on that. But I do mix it with the fat grafting when, with the fat, because then you have the blood uh, stem cells mixed with the fat stem cell together. And that is something that really for the face is a powerful uh, regeneration uh, effect. So, but not a lot. Not a standalone. So I'm going to ask you a question, quite a difficult question. We discussed it last night with the uh, Another one of your colleagues, an ophthalmologist from Canada. Yes, yes, I mean that. Retrobulba, how many are these, or supraorbital? What are you going to go for? I will stop you right here because I want you to be fully and whoever uh, listen to you. Be aware that you will get, no, I mean, if, we, if the message that if you get blindness, we really need to train practitioners to inject hyaluronidase retrobulbo. That's not a no way uh, concept because it has been showed by a paper by, I cannot tell you the names right now. I, I need to bring them up in the talk, but they try to, they put the uh, pieces of optic nerve in a bath of hyaluronidase. And there was, uh, inside the optic nerve, there was the hyaluronic acid. And they, the hyaluronidase did not make it in. So there is no crossing of the dura sheets of the optic nerve. See, I mean, if you think, you get a blind patient, send it to the ophthalmologist, and if he does right, you can recover your vision. It's not yeah. that, so it's not gonna. I I, 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 I certainly wouldn't attempt it because you can do more damage than actual good. And as you said, the, the, the dura, the optic dura, that the Hal one of these doesn't penetrate uh, through the optic dura. Um, so you're going to waste your time and your efforts. My, my immediate management for those cases would be to put the patient in a car and drive them to the, that's the best chance of but, salvaging the, the, but, the, but the, the that, retina. Yes, but the, even that, the, the maneuvers that you can do are limited. I mean, uh, it's like anti-glaucoma, but talk to, yeah, to an ophthalmologist, they, they will not to know how to do it. But the, the same De Laurenti say, holy yellow is behind the eyes is not going to be effective. So. Yeah, because I've, I've seen a couple of very new commentaries that, uh, with a couple of authors. I'm not going to mention it because there is a, a little bit of backwards and forwards debate about um, scleral um, uh, how many one of these uh, different different methods to get it to the back of the eye? I, I would uh, try intravascular. Probably I would intravascular. Try, yeah. I would try so intravascular. more of the because you're pretty. It's pretty easy into the super super orbital. You can find that exactly. Or even, okay. So or even the angular. Yeah, the angular would be would be really easy. Just here and just pump it exactly. under pressure. Exactly. Yeah. So we've got lots of questions like uh, ocular massage. How would you how yeah. would you do an ocular massage? <laughs> like that. You've got you, you've got twenty <laughs> seconds. So it's like. if you press if you press really hard for about five fifteen seconds and release <laughs> and 
I keep doing it. Francesco, the time has gone so quick. We have 15 seconds. I'd like to thank you so, so much for this. It's been amazing. I think we need to get you back on because there's so many unanswered questions. I, I love and I, and I, I've loved this. I love the fact that we've agreed on lots of things and I love the fact that we've disagreed. 